We have a wonderful program today, and we're starting to talk about uh, performance space. Uh, you know that uh, we do have one section of PQ dedicated to performance space, and we have this uh, brilliant panelists here today to talk about their projects. So now I'm gonna give word over to Andrew Filmer, who is the curator of performance space section, and who's gonna be moderator for the section. Thank you, Andrew. Fantastic. Thanks, Barbara, and thanks everyone for coming this morning. It's the first uh, session of the morning, so thank you for getting up if you've had a late night, been out uh, partying or chillaxing. So welcome to Acts of Assembly, uh, projects from the Performance Space ex Exhibition. As Barbara mentioned, my name's Andrew Filmer. I'm the curator of the Performance Space Exhibition, and I'll be moderating this morning's panel. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joined by representatives of four uh, projects from the exhibition. I'm going to start by introducing them and their projects now in the order that we'll then hear from them. Then I'm going to spend a little bit of time introducing the exhibition and its concern with assembly. So just to briefly introduce the people who are spread across the couches here. Um, firstly, here we have Meg White and Helen Hopkins, and they're going to be talking about uh, La Mama Theatre and the rebuilding of the iconic Australian experimental theatre, La Mama, after it was gutted by fire in 2018. Um, Helen, who is here, is an actor, scriptwriter, and producer. She's also deputy chair of the La Mama Committee of Management. And Meg White, uh, next to Helen, is an architect, designer, and performer, and was the design architect for the rebuild of La Mama. Then next we have Andreas Skurtis, and also absent we have Robert Kagundu. Yeah. Um, and they're going to be talking, they're going to show a video, and you'll, you'll hear from Robert in the video, as well as Andreas. Uh, they're going to talk about a new performing arts centre for the International School of Uganda in Kampala. Um, Andreas is a London-based architect, sonographer and lecturer at the Royal Central School of Speech and Drama. And Robert Kagundu is the principal and founding director of Arch Forum and also president of the Uganda Society of Architects. So we've got uh, double acts, uh, whether present or absent today. Next on the, the couch is Mark Rees, and Mark uh, is also in absentia, we have Jenny Hall. Uh, Mark is an interdisciplinary artist, uh, curator, and director of groundbreaking site-specific projects uh, rooted in Wales but across the world. And Jenny is an architect, carpenter, artist, and director of the architecture studio Crafted Space. And Mark's going to show a bit of video and talk about Agora a temporary meeting place for an assembly of active citizens which was built at the 2018 National Estedford in Llanroost in Cymru, Wales. Finally, we have uh, Kevin Pinverdick and Shauna Janssen, and they're going to discuss their project, their uh, site-responsive extended reality installation, This Space is for You. Um, Kevin is a performance designer based in Montreal and a PhD ca candidate at Concordia University. And Shauna is a performance designer and professor at Concordia University in Montreal as well. So before we hear from the panel, I just want to introduce the exhibition um, and its concern with assembly and just frame this morning's discussion because there will hopefully be quite a bit of time for some discussion amongst the panel and also questions for you. And we really would value your... Um, your questions, your insights to kind of further the, the discussion. So the Performance Space Exhibition, which is called Acts of Assembly, um, provides a forum for thinking through, reconsidering how theatres and performance spaces operate as Acts of Assembly and sites for community. If you haven't yet visited it, you can find it on level five of the National Gallery of Prague's Trade Fair Palace. Um, so it's a short walk or tram ride from here, um, so please do. The exhibition asks three key questions. How do performance spaces create connections? Uh, how do they facilitate encounters? And how do they function as sites for social action and the making of culture? And by approaching performance space through the concept of assembly, I, I hope that three related meanings are kind of set in play through the exhibition. Firstly, that of an assembly as a group of people, a crowd or group of people like we have here. Secondly, assembly is the putting together or construction of an object or a piece of machinery. So working with the material, a material assembly. And thirdly, assembly is the gathering of a deliberative or decision-making body. By focusing on the dynamics of different acts of assembly and positing 
performance as an assemblage of bodies and technologies and materials and texts and situations. The exhibition seeks to explore the productive continuities and antagonisms between more traditional ideas of theatre architecture and also the broader emergent qualities of performance space. I think the COVID-19 pandemic is, uh, is key in this as well. And it was obviously a factor in thinking through the concept for the, the exhibition. Um, COVID unsettled our acts of theatrical assembly, if indeed they've ever been settled. And it has served as a catalyst for rethinking many of our assumptions about theatre, about the world in which we make theatre, and the relationship of theatre to that world. And I think if we think of the COVID-19 pandemic as particularly not just a public health emergency, but an ecological crisis, um, then we can see how it disrupted the operation of theatres and performance spaces as physical sites of assembly by requiring us to adapt to the unseen, undetectable presence of a virus. And I think such adaptations, particularly the widespread adoption of event streaming and digital media, have asked us to consider digital platforms as performance spaces and performance as an assemblage which can take place in multiple places, with and for different groups of people simultaneously. The open call for the exhibition emerged uh, out of what was called the Ever After Project. So when I was thinking about what might a, a, a good open call be for a, a exhibition of performance space at PQ this year. It came from this Ever After project, which was a design, conceptual and design-led project initiated by Mike Pearson, the theatre maker and, um, and academic, uh, in April 2020. And that explored the implications of the pandemic for theatre and performance. And it was run in collaboration with National Theatre Wales. And this idea of assembly, of gathering, of how we gather in changed and changing circumstances remained throughout our discussions. I think the closure of theatres in many places across the world at different times revealed the extent to which they are an anthropocentric apparatus, adapted to particular stable ecological conditions that we've enjoyed in the Holocene, but ill-adapted to the instabilities of the Anthropocene. Now, in the open call for the exhibition, aside from saying acts of assembly and, and positing that as a key focus, and setting out the key questions, which I outlined earlier, contributors were invited to submit a portfolio of material traces, which could include one or more of the following. A short film, an architectural fragment, a sound recording, a visual image of any kind, an object or thing. And I ask that contributors provide these in a way that would provide insight into the specific qualities of the space being offered, its feel, its textures, its atmospheres, its actions, its operations. So what you will find in the exhibition, if you've been to it or you're yet to enjoy it, is a wide variety of performance spaces and approaches to exhibiting these in the context of PQ. And we have a cross-section represented here. There are examples of new build theatres, there's renovations of existing theatres or rebuilds of theatres, adaptations of found spaces, interventions into public spaces, uh, spaces of encounter with the more than human world. A number of exhibits explore the possibilities of digital platforms and technologies in a directly experiential way. We have a travelling theatre, the Drifting Room, that leaves the gallery and walks the streets. And there are 16 films. I think the question of what contemporary theatres or performance spaces might be seems more complicated than ever. Um, but it's also more open and I think certainly more urgent. And the answers to that question lie in the space between performance and architecture. Performance space and performance spaces are vital social infrastructures. And I think they're a necessary means by which we continue to work out how we can live together in our lively but fractured and damaged world. So my hope for the exhibition is that we might glimpse future possibilities for theatre and performance spaces through the many wonderful contributors and exhibits that make it up. Um, and this panel, just to finish, is intended as an extension of the exhibition, providing some time to delve into some of the projects in more detail and to consider the light they shed on the actions and operations of contemporary, the actions, the operations and the questions that attend to contemporary performance spaces more broadly. So, I'd like to hand over now to, uh, we're gonna, the way we'll run this panel is we'll, we'll hear from each speaker or speakers in turn 
and then we'll open up for discussion and questions towards the end. So I'd like to hand over now to uh, Meg White and Helen Hopkins, and they're going to talk about acts of assembly, acts of reassembly, La Mama Theatre. So please welcome Meg and Helen. Jan, are you there? Now. It's so small, but such big things come out of this place. The Mama creates something that no other theatre creates. It creates up-close drama. The audience is right there on top of you. The acting style has to be real, uh, has to be urgent and, and pressing. It, it offers energy and a playing style that's totally authentic. For me, La Mama is the perfect theatre makers, performers, practitioners, incubator. La Mama is generosity, kindness and acceptance. La Mama is creativity incarnate. The simplicity, the integrity, the intimacy, these are things that are so, that once you've started working in La Mama, you know that they are so precious. So, Dobri Den, hello. Today we want to share with you the story of La Mama, a little theater with a big heart, the fire event that gutted the building, and a community that took the opportunity to grow back bigger and better. Firstly, we'd like to acknowledge that La Mama Theater is on the traditional land of the people of the Kulin Nation. We give our respect to the elders of these traditional lands and to all First Nations people, past, present, and future. And we're just going to catch up on the slide. <laughs> La Mama Theatre was born in 1967, when its founder, Betty Burstall, rented an old brick factory in an inner suburb of Melbourne to set up a coffee house style theatre, modelled on the off-off Broadway theatres she had experienced in New York, in particular, Ellen Stewart's La Mama Theatre. From its first show, it has always been a place which has sat the audience only an arm's length from the performers. Each show is supported with a rent-free theatre space, a modest production budget, a split of the box office giving 80% of the ticket sales to the artists. Front of house staff are also provided for each performance. This low-risk model encourages experimentation and an artist-led style of theatre that is often non-conventional, immediate and compelling. Creative offerings come in many forms, including plays, readings, poetry, music and films. A broad range of voices are welcomed and supported. In 2017, La Mama and her community celebrated her 50th birthday. In 2018, the much-loved theatre was gutted by fire. Very little remained. There was an immediate decision to rebuild. Government bodies, philanthropists and the arts community joined together to raise the money for the rebuild. The Banksia, a native Australian flower releasing her seeds for new growth after fire, was harnessed as a regenerative symbol for the rebuild. The desire was to restore her, the theatre to her former humble and intimate self, whilst also harnessing this opportunity to deliver improved amenities and technical facilities, as well as additional space if possible. Accessibility for all users was a priority to enhance La Mama's philosophy of being open to all. I'd like to share some observations about La Mama from an architectural perspective so you can understand some of her nuances. The little two-storey brick factory it inhabits has a footprint of just 55 square metres. The ground floor theatre space has five doors, five windows, a set of stairs and a fireplace. So this is not your typical theatre 
this is an old factory where stories are created and shared. The theatre is a flexible space. Each show is free to arrange and dress the space to suit their purposes. There aren't really any rules. The relationship between the performers and their audience can be sculpted too. The upstairs space accommodated both staff and artists with desks, makeup mirrors, costume racks and a lounge. Things could get pretty cosy up there, particularly around tech and dress rehearsal time. Interestingly, there is no foyer at La Mama. Instead, there is a courtyard that serves for pre- and post-show gatherings. There also wasn't a formally built box office until recent years, prior to which front of house would just set up a little table and have a metal box and sell raffle tickets out of that. And there was a raffle as well for whatever there was too much of in the theatre that needed to be gotten rid of. <laughs> Sets or books or whatever. Performances weren't necessarily confined to the theatre. The car park, whoops, I'm not moving, oh, there we go. The car park come forecourt and the courtyard have been the site of many performances as well as community gatherings. All these observations were assembled to help reveal the pre-existing conditions and the evolution of and the use of spaces over the theatre's 50-year history. These observations were enhanced with nuanced details and desires revealed through engagements with key staff and creatives. Models and collages provided a basis for an ongoing engagement. The result of all of these processes is a series of architectural outcomes that resonate in tangible and intangible ways that deliver an architecture that is grounded in the cultural and physical history of the theatre and her community. Now, the theatre has been restored to her former simple beauty, including her windows, five windows, five doors, stairs and fireplace, but now with greatly enhanced technical facilities. Um, if you have any questions about how wonderful the technical facilities are, uh, John Ford is here, he's just over there. He ran, I don't know, it seemed like a cubic meter of the wiring through every possible gap in brickwork and what have you, and it can do everything. Um, but my job was to make sure it looked exactly like it always did, which is that it couldn't really do anything technical. <laughs> A new, sto uh, sorry, oh, there are the doors and the windows, sorry, and the stairs, the fireplace, and running, that's an operating fireplace in the theatre. Get that one past your building certifier. <laughs> a new two-storey building, an echo of the original gabled roof form, but rotated 90 degrees, is introduced downstage on the site. It provides space for admin and rehearsals. The new building and her ancillary spaces all sit atop a raised deck, and this is inspired by the original theatre entry stair landing. This has now been expanded across the site, and stairs and a lift bring people from the forecourt level to the newly raised courtyard level. At the street front of the new building, this raised deck unfurls itself as welcoming steps. These steps, set within the broader public forecourt, propose an additional space for performances or audience seating. The act of welcoming and the sharing of stories is brought to the street. The heritage listed toilet has been partially dismantled, sorry, I got a bit behind there, and reconfigured as an announcing and performance platform. And it is now in full operation. Uh, the graffiti that was all on the walls there is, was photographed, documented, and then it's redeployed throughout the new toilets. So there's this uh, feeling of continuation. Many other informal sites for creative eruptions occur across the site, including the bridge link, the mezzanine, which is tucked into the ceiling of the old building the external stairs, and even the new accessible toilet, which is considered to be too large, not to be used as a gallery and performance space, when not in use as a toilet. <laughs> so. Salvaged materials are reinterpreted and embedded in the new spaces, maintaining a connection to a cherished past. 
the former magically folding corrugated iron fence is reinterpreted as operable awnings on the box office. The interior of the box office is lined with salvaged theatre floorboards. There we go, with the burning as well. Uh, the theatre floor joists have been refashioned into a garden bed. A charred beam hangs above this and is period periodically overgrown with greenery, a reference to our Australian landscape that responds to fire with new growth. Now, anyone who's seen the exhibit, that's the beam that's in the exhibit that we've brought from Australia <laughs> to here. In line with Lamama being an artist-led space, artists were engaged to contribute to the rebuild wherever possible. Artists' works include two murals, future, feature pendant lights, signage, a sink, chair covers and other feature fittings. One of the murals is in the new accessible toilet, lending this otherwise banal space a gallery-like feeling. And that's a show being performed in there. Throughout the rebuild, and whilst we live with various stages of pandemic lockdowns, the community were kept in the loop, quite literally, with the aid of a time-lapse camera that captured the progress of the build at 20-minute intervals. The rebuild of this beloved theatre was a collective act of hope and generosity by the government bodies, philanthropists, and the Lamama community, who raised over $3 million dollars as well as the rebuild team with the design and process led by Meg, who delivered an outcome that exceeds all expectations and gives back La Mama to her community so art can continue to be made at this important experimental engine room. Yeah. Yeah. We're here and there's stuff happening here and if you're interested, come and check it out. Um, we've already got so many existing interested community people, but to, to kind of put it out there a bit more, particularly this building sits on the front of the property. So we are a bit more in your face, Carlton. And I wanted to celebrate that and to be seen from Ligon Street. I never ever want La Mama to be seen as um, a conventional space. I always want it to be seen as an ultimately flexible space. We present artist-led theatre. We try to be very attuned to what artists want and move with them rather than us defining them, which I always think is the tail wagging the dog. And while we can honour our community and be artist-led, I don't think we're in any danger of, of vanishing. Brilliant, thank you. So thank you, Meg and Helen, for kicking us off with that really fascinating insight into the, the rebuild and the reassembly of La Mama. I'm now going to pass over to Andreas Skurtis and to Robert Kagundu in absentia to talk about the new, the new performing arts centre, uh, the new theatre for the International School in Uganda in Kampala. Andreas. Hello. Uh, that was amazing. Thank you. <laughs> um, in a different part of the world now, this is what uh, I discovered um, um, f uh, six years ago or seven years ago in 2016. Um, I never use LinkedIn, but because everyone has a profile, I have one, and because I have a profile on LinkedIn, um, I do have some stuff there, so one can see my profile and know who I am. So one day um, in 2016, I received a message on LinkedIn inviting me to consider collaborating with um, an architectural practice in Kampala, in Uganda, um, and uh, consider to be uh, the design leader including their team, to work towards a project which was going to be a performing arts centre for the International School um, of Uganda in Kampala. I thought that it was a spam, so I didn't pay attention to it. <laughs> in fact, <laughs> I, was, I was really impressed um, and almost in disbelief that someone actually has 
taking the time to write such an amazing brief for a spam. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> who does that? Um, and then a week later, I thought, well, I'm going to actually find who they are and I'm going to somehow appreciate the time and effort they took. Within five minutes, I was able to download the strategic plan for the next five years um, of you know, their action of the International School of Uganda and see a full description of a proposed new development, a, perform a new performing arts uh, center, a new building there. And I thought, oops, that's not a spam. <laughs> <laughs> So I um, contacted back the London-based agent who has contacted me on behalf of uh, ARC Forum and Robert Kigundu in Kampala. And within days, I, had, I have had the first Skype. It was Skype then. It was, Zoom was not in the air um, yet. So I did the first Skype meeting with them. And very, very quickly, I um, have agreed to work with them, so I led um, a large team, um, including ARC Forum, um, uh, an architectural practice in Kampala, and um, two more teams from Johannesburg, South Africa, an acoustics um, design and uh, consultation office and a lighting design consultation office. And um, in November 2022, uh, the building uh, opened and um, um, I am really happy about it. <laughs> uh, it was a long story as it is um, most of the time with um, with architectural projects. My huge joy, I'm going. so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, show you the video um, on the project that we have created, uh, co-created and co-directed with uh, Panos Andrianos who is here right now. Um, in which we are hoping you know, to shed some light on um, aspects of what this building uh, can contribute, not only to the International School of uh, Uganda, but also to the wider community, the city of Kampala. Uh, in particular, the theater that is in the center of, um, of the building, and it is a new 460 seat uh, theater. Um, you can see the full um, team that has collaborated for this project. Uh, this is a screenshot for um, PQ's uh, website. Um, I wanted to underline a few of the important assemblies that took place during the project, one of which was me meeting with the students. Uh, so this international school there has students for, from 62 countries. Um, so my perception on what it would be to go to Kampala to work and workshop with students and staff of the International School of, um, of um, Uganda, uh, explore what is happening there, et cetera, et cetera. My perceptions have changed a lot. Um, I didn't think it would be what, what it was. I, a few things, upon, uh, we reflect upon that uh, with Robert Higundu in the video that I'm going, we are going to show you. Um, I wanted to show you also a, a sketch, which um, was a first, um, a first drawing that um, I did very, very early in the process. And um, as often as it often happens with architecture, this the building that is now um, operating is exactly that sketch over there. Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't feel I don't feel I should spend more time to actually um, share more drawings uh, with you. Um, what um, also was fast, I, it was the first time I was designing a building um, in which I didn't need to include air conditioning or heating because of the climate in Kampala, amazing. We should all move there, actually. Um, and also another important assembly that took place um, there, which was the gathering and the collaboration of, of an international team. So this is from 2018, that was my last visit there. Concrete work is halfway through. Um, before completion, and um, in this photo, the happy face of me, of me is surrounded by um, uh, the team in Uganda and uh, also the consultants from, uh, from Johannesburg, um, South Africa. Uh, this is a screenshot of the theater, which is in the center of the building. So it's a, a, apart from the theater that you're going to see uh, shots of um, in the video, um, the building includes rehearsal spaces, studios, and facilities for four departments, drama, music, dance, and fine arts. Um, and um, 
I think we should show the video now and leave some time to actually um, discuss later on um, and any questions you have. Do I play it or? Uh. have a clear intention to actually use this not only as the theatre of the International School of Uganda that is, that, that it is built for, but their intention is to open it up to the com wider community of uh, Kampala. It's actually the new theatre of Kampala. Am I right to say that um, uh, this is actually the new theatre of Kampala and somehow it's going to make um, an impact in the city. Yes, you're right to say that. Um, if you do remember in the brief that we had with the head of school, she was very keen on making sure that the building can be accessed uh, from either side from, without going into this through the school to access the building so that the building could be used by the community in Kampala. That shows, you know, the gaps between uh, the spaces. So if we compare it with that, that's, that's the whole essence of this building, actually. That was the first complete uh, sketch that I did. And at the end, the whole building is totally that. It hasn't changed. That's yeah. all. Mm -hmm. So basically, the center of it is a um, theater. So that's, that's a foyer and a gallery, a theater, 460 seats. Behind that, a workshop and loaded, loading bay. And these three volumes are uh, rehearsal spaces, studios, recording studios. We do have an amphitheater in Kampala. It's um, an amphitheater which is open to the sky and everything, but that probably sits a little bit more, probably 800, but for a properly enclosed theater with a roof over and everything, this is the biggest um, auditorium that we've got. Uh, I especially enjoyed the fact that you, you, you had ideas about how the line of sight should be, how the seats should be arranged so that the, no, uh, you know, one, one person does not obstruct the other. So you're a very, very important member of the team. There will be so many um, collaborations if the school especially opens up because we've got a lot of uh, arts performances, people coming down here, and we have a lot of what we call makeshift theaters. Okay. They were not designed as theaters, but uh, you know, some architects go into some spaces and turn them around, provide a platform. It's more of a, a, a hall, kind of, you know, a big hall. So those are there. And the, the people who perform or the performers really do not want to work with those spaces because they don't give them what they want. But this particular space gives you exactly what you want. You, you know how to work with the, with the curtains, you know how to work with the sounds, the lights, and everything is working perfectly. I like that you've put the theatre in the centre. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It yeah. Makes it all. yeah, that was that was really important actually to mm. have the theatre as the core of the building and all the departments to communicate easily with the theatre and use it obviously. Yeah. There is a lot of joy in using public space. Uh, Absolutely. Public public space and private space in a mixture. So I love seeing people being outside, yeah. celebrating, uh, being together. So I think it's, I think one of the most important assemblies and gatherings that 
are happening in buildings that, uh, of that nature and of that international uh, collaboration. So I remember that moment really, really well. Uh, yes. And, 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 and this, yeah. this, this actually is a very good representation. I can see the people from South Africa there, the Ugandan team is there, yeah. uh, the head of school is there. So, I mean, it's a good representation of all the stakeholders who are working on the project. Um, is that, is that going to be open to public? It can be used the way we designed it, the way it's accessible. It can be used by the community without going through the school. And the community in Kampala can have their performances there without disturbing the rest of the school programs. Thanks. Thank you, Andreas. And we'll certainly have time for questions. I, I'm particularly interested to think about how the school is able to then um, fulfill that desire to open a, a theatre that can serve both itself and the wider community in the city. And we might reflect on that as well. Um, I'm now going to pass over to Mark Rees, who is going to speak about Agora, um, which was a temporary theatre and a, a series of associated um, events at the 2018 National Stedford in Llanrust, Wales. Mark. Um, Boreda, good morning. Um, as Andrew said, my name is Mark Rees. I live in Wales. Um, I'm a curator and creator of installation and performance. My work is an artistic response to place and community. My approach can often be described as an archaeologist, exhuming the multi-layered history of a site, unearthing uh, fragments of fact or fiction. I then examine these findings in detail, then work with artists, performers, and members of the community to deduce, interpret, and reimagine. This rediscovered material is then molded into a composite portrait for an audience to encounter as an immersive experience. So I'm here to talk about Agora, Govod Anibanol, either Chmagid of Ordol, an Agora, an independent space to imagine a future. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to talk a little bit about Jenny, my wonderful collaborator, um, who's an architect based in Machantleth. I love working with architects because they really stretch you and challenge you, especially someone like Jenny, who is so direct and wonderful and can really provoke you to rethink and your imagination. So she's really wonderful. Um, but before I talk about that, there's another architect who is a great influence on me. Um, and it's a notion that it underpins my site-specific work, and it's that of host and ghost, invented by the late architect Cliff McLucas, who was part of the pioneering Welsh physical theatre company, Brith Gorv, for whom I worked with for over 10 years and has had a kind of profound impact on my work. So here we go. You can categorise site-specific performance as the coexistence and overlay of two basic sets of architectures, those of the existing building, the host, that which is at site, and those of constructed installation sonography, or the ghost, that which is temporarily brought to site. The host has the personality, history, character, narrative written into it. The ghost a means to absorb, filter, and reconfigure the traces of its transitory parent. Now, Professor Mike Pearson, Andrew has already alluded to, Breath Gove's founder member further explains host and ghost, to construct another architecture within the existing architecture, imposing another arrangement, floor plan, map, 
or orientation which confounds everyday hierarchies of place and patterns of movements. Significantly, these two might have quite different origins and they might ignore each other's presence. They are coexistent but not necessarily congruent. The performance remains transparent. So next slide. Um, another architect um, I worked with, if you go to the next slide, that'd be great. Um, is that okay? Ah, great. Um, another wonderful architect I worked with, an Australian architect called Benedict Anderson, and he was also a dance dramaturg, so this kind of combination was wonderfully kind of inspirational. Uh, in 2019, no, 20, 2009, sorry, we were commissioned by uh, Laboral, Ciudad de Cultura in Gijón in Spain, and this was an extraordinary site. It's a former orphanage built in 1950, and it took us six hours to, to be given a tour. And it was amazing because it was sort of semi-derelict, and you had these incredible classrooms, hallways, um, various rooms, completely cluttered with amazing kind of uh, furniture and artifacts and memorabilia. So it was a real gift. So I invited 20 artists, 12 from um, Spain and eight from Wales to come with me and explore this amazing site. And um, that's what we did. We spent two weeks exploring the site and bringing that to life and animating that to life through kind of mainly performative works and installation works. This is a piece called Forest by Benedict Anderson. And it's one of the largest elliptical domes in Europe. It's vast. And we were like, what the hell are we going to do in here? Uh, and beneath it, we discovered hundreds of pews, which were kind of like just abandoned in the kind of, in the vaults, in the crypt, totally covered in dust. And we then upsided, put one up, up uh, you know, um, stood one up, and then thought, oh, we can create a forest. Then we discovered each pew accounted for a tree that was felled in a former Spanish African colony and transported back to Laboral. So that's a, well, that's a very powerful kind of image. So we created this forest that uh, people could observe from the top layer and even higher. And then we invited a dancer. You can see the Tanya Roman Finnish Welsh dancer to explore that forest and that gigantic space. Um, now, uh, do next slide. So this is Hollow by Jenny Hall. So abandoned copper mines are the inspiration for Hollow. It's an interactive work exploring deconstruction and construction. The mine is represented in the hollow, in the center, and the cardboard boxes represent the ore that has been extracted. Um, and the public then were invited to stack, restack, construct, create new shapes because the boxes are, have small magnets. And also then it's constructed on a large mirror floor. So you can consider the relationship between the spaces we create above and below the ground. Next slide, please. This is a piece called Parade by National Dance Company Wales, uh, choreographed by Caroline Finn, featuring the uh, BBC Wales National Orchestra on the stage of the Wales Millennium Centre. Next slide. Um, it is, was 2017, and it was a radical reinterpretation re 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 of Parade, the radical ballet by, created by Diaghilev, music by Satin, designed by Picasso, so it was uh, no pressure there. Um, <laughs> And uh, it was a wonderful, because we you, you know, incorporated the boxes from Hollow. Also, we looked at uh, Metropolis, the film by Fixlin, and it was kind of a wonderful, again, collaboration with uh, Jenny on this one. Um, next slide. This is called Proto Ellipse, and is a kind of uh, social musical sculpture as, as an extension of the organ. It's a kind of harpsichord come harp. It's in a wonderful chapel, Baptist chapel, in Llandidno, in uh, North Wales, which I curated this space. I also curated my own wedding to my husband here uh, as part of the event. And it's a very, very special space. Um, and also, what was wonderful is this instrument was very social. So people could come in, and many people would then kind of, who didn't know each other, would play on this amazing instrument and would chat as they were kind of improvising. It was very special. Um, next slide. So, oh, and the next one. Uh, and this is a detail of Agora, Govod Anibanol, Ida Khmagi Dovodol, an independent space to imagine a future. Commissioned by the National Eisteddfod in 2019 and Visit Wales, uh, the Eisteddfod is a celebration of um, 
Welsh language and Welsh culture, and it's the largest music and poetry festival in Europe, and it's peripatetic, kind of altering between South and Wales every year. So I'm now going to show uh, a five-minute film of explaining Agora. Dioch. Tandrus itself has a fascinating history linked to independence, because from Llywelyn Ein Llywolaf, uh, Llywelyn the Last, uh, he declared Llanrwst independent in 1287. And then in 1947, the town council wrote to the um, United Nations asking for that uh, to be reinstated, which was rejected. And interestingly enough, then uh, Llywelyn Ein Llywolaf's grandson, Llywelyn Vau, Llywelyn the Great, and this is a portrait of him by pure evil, his empty sarcophagus is in um, the local church. So for me, it was a real opportunity to draw attention to that you know, fascinating history, but also to create a contemporary space to respond to that. Now, Agora is the Greek word for a central public open space for debate and discussion. It was the heart of democracy. So for me, it was really key that Agora had a kind of skin that would represent a kind of a, a democratic demeanour in its very fabric. So I invited the people of Conwy to donate their, their wooden doors, ordinary doors, and the doors came in their masses. We had over a hundred. In fact, there are exactly 100 doors surrounding Agora. It's a really interesting skin to have. And for me, it was important that I wanted to have it black on the outside for it to look slightly kind of foreboding and mournful to link in with Llewellyn's tear because Llewellyn is crying for the mess that we've got ourselves into politically, economically, ecologically, environmentally. So this is an opportunity to really talk about that. The idea was that in the design, working with Tabitha and Jenny, that it would resemble Llewellyn's crown, kind of cut up like a silhouette, and also would resemble a castle or a fortress and also had a, a kind of pathway leading up to it with this kind of heraldic-like shapes on the back of these placards. It's kind of obvious when you look at Agora, the kind of chevron shape is really pronounced. And the reason why is that um, recently, the, the newest building that's open in St. Fagans, the Na uh, National History Museum in Cardiff, is uh, Llys Llewellyn, which is a kind of reimagining of what Llewellyn Llys, or one of his uh, courts, would look like, you know, Agora is a reinterpretation of a reinterpretation, and I really like that. It's a, it's a contemporary version of his court. Outside, as I said, it's quite foreboding, but then inside, I wanted to have the cosy atmosphere where people could sit on the chairs that we made. It had the fabric from Melin to Gwent. I wanted to introduce the red kind of color. The chevron is actually, you know, featured again. When you look at the reimagining of the, at least uh, Llewellyn's court, it's like, this kind of shape, red and white, and it totally looks like and resembles a caution tape, that kind of plastic tape that you put to warn people of danger. So I think I kind of like that idea that politically, yes, this is a space to discuss important issues, but then you are surrounded by this foreboding cloud hanging over it, which I think really represents the current political situation, because I, I feel strongly that currently you can make work that doesn't address the, the political climate and the, the actual climate. And so this was an opportunity to bring those to the fore, to invite artists. There were like 12 performances happening in Agora. And also then we had several splinter projects that were happening around Conoy. We also had All Llewellyn, the opening event. On the first Saturday, this dead one performers that Eddie Ladd led. So I wanted to have placards in it because I wanted the audience then to process to protest the whole way from the Goddess of Stones to the plastic Goddess of Stones, the Estedvod, and then led up to Agora to open it itself. And on that route then, there were opportunities for you to learn a bit about kind of historical, you know, uh, protests within we well, in Welsh history. And so that Eddie would then kind of uh, comment on, but also there was an opportunity to take photographs of kind of famous protests, especially the one on the bridge. So there was a, it was like a kind of guided tour, historical mapping. Iwan Williams is, was the creative producer, and he already had an idea 
in mind of developing, of creating a passport for Llanrust. So we expanded on that. We had four passport control officers and basically you could then be handed a passport, have your photo taken and you would become a, you know, a citizen of Llanrust. And then you'd have to collate then stamps one from Agora, the first one, and then there were like more than 30 dotted around town from independent businesses. So again, it's celebrating independence and it's also about, you know, looking out. It's about internationalizing and not internalizing. I think that, you know, that is a key element that was, you know, running through Agora. Fantastic. Thank you, Mark. And it's wonderful to see that work um, then also now being further internationalised here at PQ as well. So I'm sure we can pick up um, and talk about these ideas of architecture, the host and the ghost, and, and architectures within architectures as well shortly. I'm going to hand over to our final uh, two speakers today, and that is Shauna Janssen and Kevin Pinvedic, and they're going to be talking about their site-responsive extended reality installation, which if you haven't done, you can do so in the remaining days of PQ, um, and it's called This Space Is For You. Good morning, everyone. Um, I was just thank you. I want to say thanks to the presenters um, that have already spoken, and um, I'm really interested in the conversation because of the way you are also um, rolling out ideas of the archaeology of site and the ghost and the host. Because I think there's many different ways that uh, Kevin and I have been thinking about the making of this project um, that's relevant and resonates in terms of these uh, concepts and feelings and affects and atmospheres of space. Um, so. The, the f interesting thing about talking about this work and what you're going to see really briefly here is that it's really becoming a project that's completing, it's the, also the beginning of a project really, but it's completing itself because we're here and we are engaging with a public that's coming into our, our mixed extended reality um, project. So, so really clearly to say that our project is a virtual and augmented reality experience. Um, and it's a site-based piece that was made for, um, well, for the PQ um, and for the site that we're in. And I don't want to give away too much, but now we have incredible documentation um, of people being in this uh, virtual mixed world um, that we can't share with you. So you have to come and experience the work. Um, and I'll just situate myself really uh, quickly too. Um, as Andrew said, I'm based in Montreal at Concordia University. Uh, I'm, I'm a professor in the Department of Theatre there. Um, and when I'm not wearing my teaching hat or doing a lot of admin work, I'm trying to um, connect with a research creation practice. And I come from um, making site-specific work and actually in very, very analog, community-engaged, socially-engaged ways. So this project is a real departure. Um, and it's really um, ideas taking form um, with digital technology um, that we started really embracing and working with about eight or nine months ago. And um, yeah, so it's, so it's interesting to start to be thinking about the performance. I've always um, had a passion for thinking about the agency of space and space as a collaborator in what we do, that there is no such thing as an empty space. Um, and so we've entered this, um, this world and we're just gonna walk you through our research creation process a little bit. Um, and we're happy to talk more about that. So it is research creation. So we have a lot of um, questions emerging and, and, and um, one of the big themes we're working with um, is this idea of refugia. Uh, so this space is for you is really a conceptual place for considering how mixed reality experiences perform Refugia and Donna Haraway um, has been very influential in us in terms of thinking through um, kind of the more than human and, and a feminist perspective in the work we're doing. Um, and she she's um, actually responding to Anna Singh by talking about refugia as a place of regeneration from which diverse species assemblages with or without people can be reconstituted after major events. 
Um, we're also, so we weren't over intellectualizing or theorizing what we were doing as we were making, but in the making process, all of these questions and as thinkers and scholars start to emerge and these ideas and concepts. So another really helpful um, scholar, Sarah, Sarah Ahmed, has also been very helpful to us in thinking about um, what's happening, and I think it, it does relate to assembly, and I'm just making that connection right now where we're really thinking a lot in our work about orientation. Um, and disrupting the kind of technology we can use and the power we have to orient people in certain ways in these kinds of virtual spaces. But to think about that critically and to, uh, I guess, politicize that or bring the, poli how do you bring the politics to these kinds of spaces, I think is some questions I have now. And so with Sarah Ahmed, we're thinking about um, orientations um, and how they matter and how they shape what becomes socially as well as bodily given and that is how bodies materialize and take shape. So one of our research questions is, in what ways can orientation as a dramaturgical ethos foreground queerness and how we engage with the materiality of spatial production and the spatial activity of digital matter? Yeah, so I'm just gonna finish my talking um, with a couple of more questions, and then Kevin's gonna talk a little bit, like kind of reveal a bit of the secrets of our process, and we can talk more afterwards. Um, so another thing that was emerging is that, you know, there's been so much discussion around, of course, these spaces are immersive, you're immersed, um, it's a very sensory experience, and, and um, one thing I wanted to do, and, and again, kind of inspired by a lot of the thinking of colleagues that I've been getting to know over the years who are also doing this thinking about, you know, what does it mean to bring um, uh, a cinegraphic or performative um, sensibility to these kinds of spaces. Um, so this idea of reorienting the work of mixed and extended virtual reality work, um, kind of moving beyond thinking about it only in the immersive, which it always is, but to be thinking about what Lucy Thornett argues as the porous boundaries between different orders of world and between bodies and worlds. So, two more research questions. How can cinegraphic and performative approaches to mixed reality help to critically reconsider the necessary and entangled relationship between the production of place-based performance works and the stage as an intermedial site. So that's not a new idea, you know, intermedia, so, but it's something we're just really now thinking about. And how can mixed reality be understood as a kind of interruption, which is really what we are really working through now in terms of um, working through the queer orientation sensibility. So how can, um, how can this work be an interruption of the habitual and socially normative relationships between bodies and environments? So therefore, for example, the stages, venues we perform on and audiences and publics that we interact with. So there's a lot of questions that we're, we're embodying and working through as we make this work. Yes, yeah, thank you, Shona. Um, so as Shona said, uh, the, the work is a site-specific response uh, work. So uh, we engage our research creation in uh, archive materials and uh, site-specific methods and uh, dramaturgy of uh, the technology of capture. So we used uh, different methods as uh, 360 images, uh, 3D scanning, and uh, volumetric capture. Uh, we used a Polycam application to for the 3D scanning and uh, DepKit software for the volumetric capture. And the work is experienced in a headset uh, called uh, VR uh, Vario XR3, which has that incredible pass-through that can um, allow that uh, the possibility to see both the real, uh, uh, the physical um, space and the virtual one. So we have that uh, tension between those two uh, realities. And uh, so, and then we build that experience in the uh, Unity software, which, uh, it, which is a game engine uh, software. So what you think uh, on the screen here, it's a capture of, the, of, the, of my screen. So it's a software a Unity. And um, as you can see, uh, that software, has a, it's a really uh, normative space uh, oriented through the three axes, X, Y, Z. So we, um, in that idea of uh, orientation, 
and uh, disorientation and uh, queer orientation, we wanted to approach the digital uh, space and uh, um, create or define what is a queer sensitivity of digital materiality. So we play with different uh, scenographic strategy as uh, um, scaling and rotation uh, displacement uh, to produce different kinds of effects and uh, movements. Uh, then in Montreal, so we did that uh, 3D scan here in Prague in November. So we came um, in November to um, to learn about the site, about the history and uh, the speciality of the site. So we did that 3D scan and we uh, we made it a, a stage to the display different kind of contents, uh, digital contents. And then back in Montreal, um, we wanted to explore what uh, volumetric capture is. And so we built a green stage, uh, as you can see uh, here. And we asked uh, a dancer, a performer, uh, Leslie Baker, to come and explore with us in that space the movement gesture and how those capture of movements can, uh, what they can create in the digital space. So here it's, uh, maybe we can play the video, the first one, please. So here is uh, the first try of the volumetric capture work. So yeah, we play with different gestures, movements of bodies, materialities. Yeah, we can pass that. And after that, we had another try of, of yes, yeah, no, it's fine, it's fine. So yeah, we can. Uh, you can move on to the next slide, please. So yeah, so um, we brought those uh, capture of bodies and movement into the digital space to explore the figure of the body and the shape of the body and what can emerge from that uh, materiality. So the figure in the experience is both the the host of the experience, but it's also the ghost of the space, how we uh, talked uh, earlier. Uh, so maybe we can play the third video, the last one. Yeah. Yes, the last one, yeah. So here you have a, a a little, uh, the first, the, so it's the beginning of the experience. So the introduction uh, of the 3D scan and the figure of the body. So the dramaturgy we work on, it's uh, we're moving through space. We are housed by this figure, which transform uh, during the, the experience in different states of the materiality. Uh, so we play that with those, uh, have the, the, uh, we play with the digital fabrication uh, of uh, and how um, phenomenon uh, of emergence uh, can produce uh, another sensibility approach to materiality and to space. And to space yeah. Um, I think I think we could probably stop there. Actually, yeah. I see the, the time is yeah. Six minutes left for discussion. Are you okay with that? Yeah, sure. It, it, it was already, almost done. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you, everyone, for these marvellous presentations. And it's, it's a great pleasure that we can, we can share your work with a, with a broad audience here. In a, there will be microphones going around in a second. Um, I think it's, is it Joe who's there with the microphone? So please do use the microphone so that everyone can hear. And please uh, give Joe a wave so that Joe knows to give the microphone to you. Um, I was just, whoa, where's, I'll talk for a second, but there's already someone up there. Um, so I just thought it'd be worth, I, I was struck in a few, running through the presentations here, in the background of my head always is, um, is the Kenyan theatre maker and scholar Ngugi Wa Thiongo, who says that, you know, he counters, he's writing in post-colonial Kenya, he's countering the idea that, of Peter Brook, that space is empty, and he says, actually, performance space is a space of openness in response to the the incarcerating desire of the state. The state's always trying to close things down. Performance is trying to open things up. And I'm just curious if any of you would like to reflect on 
how you try and open a space and keep a space open, whether that's through the digital means, through kind of a mixture of architecture, archaeology and performance, but also in terms of built structures where as an architect you're designing in response to a brief or a situation and you're trying to create a space that will enable openness, enable negotiation to take place and not be closed down and crushed. I hope that's a, a good opening proposition. Would anyone like to respond? You have microphones here or I can pass. Meg, Meg looks like she's I could, I ready go. to dive in. Hello again. I think it's an interesting proposal because architecture very much deals with boundaries and edges. Every time we draw a line, we place some things on one side and something else on the other. And I quite often try and draw without lines, so you just draw the soft, gooey space in between. So I really loved your gooey ice creamness in there. Um, for me, it's about how those boundaries those points of negotiation, there's, there's the ritual aspect of theatres, there's that arrival, the arrival of the, the performers, the arrival of the audience. Um, there's the spaces that we go through as we come towards each other and then there's that space where we share the story. And in La Mama that's a really intense space, so performer becomes audience and audience becomes performer because you can't ignore each other, you can't shut off. Um, so I think it's about recognising each one of those transitional realms and then any physical manifestation, any um, gateway or doorway, wall, window, that it actually um, embodies itself in, a, in the cultural language. It uses the materials um, that are recognisable, that are invitational, that are... Um, I mean, La Mama has, you know, there's all these positive things. There's no foyer, for example. It's an outside space and, and you reinvent yourself there. And, in, in fact, the actors can't go home without going through the audience, which is um, can be terrifying, but that's the way it, it works. It's, it's essential because what happens in the show is only half of what happens. It's what happens after. It's the dialogue between the audience and the performer. But I think to get back to those boundaries, it's about trying to get them to have a materiality or a physicality that invites engagement, that, that offers ownership, say, to the patron or to the actor, that you offer ownership always to the inhabitants of the building, even though in a theatrical sense that's constantly changing. And that the materiality responds to that as well. So whether that's, you know, in our instance, there are recognisable artefacts that have been gathered from the seat of the fire and then placed around. So it suggests ownership and engagement. And I think that's it. I'll stop there. But yeah, I hope that made sense. It, it, it does. And I, I kind of want to ask you, Mark, about in relation to Agora, because it is, you know, this is a, the, you're riffing off the idea of the Greek agora, but you're also trying to riffing off the idea of independence, the independence, the, the desire for independence in Wales, and the des, and the creation of a space that might be independent. Also, I noticed within the context of the Estedford that sits apart. It's black. It's foreboding. It's a sea of white tents around it, and I'm just interested in how you negotiate that sense of openness, but also kind of you're setting something apart, a special place. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I mean, the, it was meant to be a poorer space, and, and, uh, and that's represented by, of course, inviting the people of Connie to, to donate their doors. Even though they look closed, it's a very open space, but you're absolutely right, because within the Eisteddfod is uh, a, quite a traditional conservative with a small c um, kind of presentations and full of white, tents with stalls from in churches and it's it's wonderful and I have a love-hate relationship with it so it was great to be a part of it but I want to be slightly removed up on the hill slightly foreboding this is my castle but you can come in here it is welcoming and it's a very open space and even I think the relationship between you know uh, performance and architecture it, I mean it's intrinsically linked because every it's, there's always something happening in there, even there's no, if there's nobody, even if somebody stumbles across, has to sit down. It's just, you know, being in the space is a kind of shelter, a safe space. And I think it's very important within the context of the Estevo to have that slight kind of like 
uh, opportunity to kind of sit back and look at the Estevo and also to contemplate the future. It's a space to, to where you can imagine the future. We are striving to be independent within Wales. Whether that will happen, I don't know. I think so. It might be a long time. I think we need it, especially given the, the uh, situation because of Brexit. So looking at that, you know, it is a political space. It has to be within that context of Llanrhus striving for independence, for Wales striving to, for independence. And, we, you know, and that's what Agora was about, an open space to imagine the potential of that exciting future, whether it be independent or not, but I hope so. Hopefully there's some questions from the floor. I think there is. So we go here and then I think this. Hi, hi there. Um, Andrew, that was a great question too. Mine, mine's a little bit adjacent to that as far as uh, you said openness. And the word I think of when I th think of what I'm trying to like attract people into my spaces with some of my students is this word belonging. And I think the uniqueness that you guys all, you all pre presented, I'm curious as to how... Uh, new patrons, people who may have been in historically underrepresented in your audiences in, in, the, in the aspects of assembly that you have, how have, uh, how have you seen like belonging be impacted within your spaces where people, people feel that this, oh, this is a, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I belonged here, but now I, I belong there in one of your spaces. How has the word belonging come into play in your, as your spaces have opened up? Thank you for that question. I'll, I'll pass the mic, but I suppose you might also be thinking about the invitation, the invitation to enter, to start to form attachment or belonging as well. Who just, they don't know anything about it. Yeah. No prior expo exposure to this type of work. I, who would like to pick this up? I, I want to be a bit controversial and say, Andreas, I think this might be really a, a big question for you because you're working within an institution of a school. Um, and that may feel separate, separate from the city and from citizens. Um, yes. I mean, I don't, I don't know the city of Kampala well, but uh, it was obvious to me from my um, journeys from the airport to uh, the campus of the International School of Kampala, that, uh, Uganda, that these were two uh, different worlds. So there was one world, the airport, then an in-between world, Kampala, and then um, another bubble, the campus of the International School of, of, uh, of Uganda. It was in the initial briefing to open up the new theater or the whole performing arts center to the city of Kampala, and that was very attractive as a, as a point in the brief. It is also our hope, even though I'm not there, even though I'm not... Um, you know, uh, doing anything there. My job is done. Um, I feel very, very strongly towards uh, them opening that space, creating an open space and um, exploring the possibility of connections between that bubble of a privately funded international school and the whole city that, even though most of us, myself included, um, are exploring performances and performance spaces beyond theatres and beyond purpose-built theatres, in Kampala, they are searching for the opposite. I th what I've felt, speaking with a few of, um, of uh, theatre professionals there, is that they really want to uh, feel that they have a new theatre. So that's why um, we have reflected in that video on the new theatre of Kampala, uh, in a way. Um, so I think that, I hope that this is going to be a platform and a new um, open space in a way, but um, who knows? Um, I think there's a, a, it's really key to have a, a, an element of playfulness because then you can transform something ordinary into something extraordinary. So it, it's, it becomes inclusive and you are invited. So in terms of Agora, they are doors. So it, it, people are like, oh, I kind of know what this is. I'm kind of curious, though I'm a bit scared. So I think it's about being playful with, within the architecture and the setting and the context. I think that's absolutely key. I might just quickly uh, get on the, the, thank you for your question. And I mean, what you can see what we presented, it's a very different kind of, 
space, <laughs> literally. Um, and I guess I would say, and it kind of connects also to you, the the launching of the this discussion around the idea of boundaries or borders, and you know, there those are colonial tools, right? And I think, um, you know, in terms of like, what's that invitation? I mean, I think we have to recognize difference, right, to start. Um, and easier said than done. That's super, super complex, and and we have to actually complicate that our understanding of that all the time. And um, I think we have to move lines. So I was thinking about what you were saying, and I think this, you know, you don't you, you don't really get a sense of that in our our, our presentation, but um, some thinking that's been really helpful to us, like even partway through, was this idea of the clumsiness. Of this idea, so it comes to me, comes back to for me about thinking through orientation again, um, and 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 how are we doing that? Like you know, and taking or having our own responsibility of ourselves that way, but also figuring out how to do that across our differences between our differences and doing that collectively. But that's why, um, like even in our so moving the lines, and this is kind of where it can get really playful and interesting in the virtual world. And I'm like, I don't like virtual reality. Um, this is a whole new thing. So even if this lives in a conceptual world, which is also real, to, get, to be able to kind of, be able to have a space for that kind of provocation to go out into the other real world um, and, and kind of be thinking about, um, yeah, our relationships um, to each other in space and how, you know, it doesn't just happen by itself, you know, that we do come to belong somewhere I, as a, maybe more a way of thinking about it than something comes to belong to us. I don't know. I'm going to stop there. <laughs> we'll come to you in a second, but just, did you, if you want to. <laughs> I really like lines um, because I, so when I said before there were lines and, and then, you know, the, the, you want to get rid of them because you always have to make the decision on what's on one side or the other. It is kind of like a binary thing. And then, so I used to erase them and then I, I actually used to draw on different types of paper so that the body of the paper could be... I collage a lot because um, it stops the line thing happening, although they keep showing up. And then I, I, we did this workshop. It was a cultural workshop with our Indigenous producer, Glenn Shea. And... We did a drawing exercise, and what I learned from... Actually, it was in the, the very first um, panel talk here, or the presentation, uh, with Jake, and they had the language map of Australia up. And each... There's little bubbles for each um, area, for each region and, and language, each cultural group. I'm sorry if I'm using the wrong words. I apologise. But what the lines mean in that context is a place to meet, it's a place where uh, you and I rub against each other and then something can be shared there. So in a way, the line has, has become something much more dynamic and sort of like, it's going to sound weird, but vibrational. It's, it's sort of like it's a whole series of lines that join two spaces together instead of being a thick line that carves a space in between. I don't know if that helps anyone. <laughs> I'm an architect. What? <laughs> I think we might also think about the thickness of the line as well, that the line itself is a, is a territory. We've strayed a long way from the question of belonging. <laughs> okay. But, uh, but I, think, I think what we're, we are talking about is those, those transitional spaces and, and the thickness of lines and that, that there are in-betweens. But I, I'm aware, sorry, as a moderator, there's somebody up the back there with a microphone. Um, yeah, first, just thank you all for speaking today. My question is, when designing these spaces, how do you leave room for future innovations, like whether technical, like lighting or sound or energy changes, or for audiences and artists wanting to use your spaces in unexpected ways? <laughs> I'm assuming that is for the, the architects amongst us. Um, John's here, so he could really answer. But in my mind, you keep it as simple as you can. So architects are are uh, there to be assistants, they're not to overlay themselves onto things, but to create openness that reflects the time, but allows for the past and the future. So what we did in La Mama was 
it, John can talk about the complexity, but it, we also kept it really simple so that it could become something. It could be, it could be completely changing right now. I hope so, actually, that the spray paint is out and everything's changing there um, through a sense of ownership. But, John, I hand over. Um, yeah, it's kind of impossible to predict the future, but <laughs> we sort of have to try. And I think we, we did try with La Mama. Um, uh, and we're also sort of asked to... There's the sort of the, the terminology of a, of a, a flexible space... Uh, and that term flexibility is really complicated. Uh, and, it, and it's really complicated in a space that's nine metres by six metres <laughs> dimensions. Uh, and I, and I, so I think that we tried to build that flexibility in there. We tried to make it accessible to people who, who want to make all sorts of different types of performance in the future. Uh, and, we, and we were also thinking about the 50-year history of the space that has been... It's a space where people can go in and make theatre with almost no experience. And that was, that was uh, really important to the process of, of making that space, I think. So that, that, I think the, the key is in the, in the word flexibility and in a whole bunch of different interpretations of that word. Yeah, I, I, I would add to this that the future in performance spaces are non-sterile spaces. So what I'm imagining for that building over there is for the theatre to become an agora uh, for not only the school in there, but the whole city, or maybe um, to be a central point to several cost-centric cost uh, circles. And... Um, several different groups of people to pass through it. Uh, so the closeness, um, which has been the perception of theatre spaces for a long time now, needs to be dissolved once and for all. But this can happen to theatres as well. It doesn't need to be a field. Um, it can be a theatre that is really um, transparent, open, and uh, um, almost as if it was an indoors um, public space. I just want to um, actually follow on from what you said, Andrew, and, and what Andreas has just said, um, in relation to what Ngugi Wathiongo said and Uganda at the moment. Um, in actual fact, this notion of incarceration as an open space, uh, which is a kind of sp space against the incarceration of the state, is literal now in Uganda. And um, I suppose it's a, an observation, really, Andreas, that one hopes that that openness... Um, in the school will extend to the queer community in Uganda, which is at the moment facing incarceration. So I think that's just an observation I want to make. And perhaps there can be some pressure put on the school that it could possibly be a space for that kind of assemblage, because that's not possible in Kampala at the moment. That's all I wanted to say. Thanks, Jane. That's a very, very important point to make, um, given the realities um, in Uganda. I think... Can we get a microphone here just to, to Deborah, I think, Joe. Thank you so much, and thank you all for your presentations. Um, I don't know whether what I'd like to share is a question or just an observation or a comment, but I'd like to tag on to what you said about belonging. Um, one of the, as an artist who lives in Kampala and who practices in Kampala, and who's trying to create space for other artists, um, really intrigued and interested in the space at the International School of Uganda. But I also know that the history of such spaces has been a history of exclusion, either based on class and resources. So I, I haven't been to the school myself and to the space, but I'm hoping that it is not going to be a space again that is going to create these barriers in, based on class, based on, on people's beliefs and what people can offer into the space. Um, I also do know that 
again, as an artist who speaks to other artists, that space would be extremely useful, but they're also looking for spaces that are versatile, that are not necessarily with permanent European structures. Um, and yeah, so I, I hope that within the space, there are other spaces that artists can use that are outdoor, that are indoor, but are versatile. Yeah, I don't know whether that's a question or I don't know. <laughs> But thank you. And Dan said something that uh, really struck me, which is because we are, we've been talking about decolonizing spaces and decolonizing our lives, but Andrea said something that really struck me, which was his, he called a bubble at the airport, a bubble the school, and the real space you called in between space, but that was the real space. Yeah, but it's, it's, I think I would like you all to, oh, to talk about that because it's, it's something that's very important, I think, to consider. And, you know. Can I build on that question? Because it's going to um, inform the question I was going to ask is uh, how much of your process, uh, of the process of creating these spaces, what is the interaction with that very colonial, um, with colonial mindsets and funding frameworks and political systems that um, how do you create those, as you so beautifully put it, those lines of um, those places of encounter and how do you navigate creating open spaces in what may feel like very closed um, administrative infrastructures? Can I, do you, do you mind, I might, Mark, are you happy to pick up on this? Because I, in a way, I know, I think in some ways it's, Andreas can speak about this in relation to the school, but we also are dealing with the questions around how an architect, the extent to which an architect is able to engage and make difference. I think you are by necessity caught up in the capitalist structures of the architecture industry. I'm gonna just, I'm gonna redirect it to Mark if I may, just because I think you're kind of dealing with, um, a very interesting post-colonial situation in Wales, which is not necessarily apparent, um, and trying to work with funding structures, but also outside of existing venues. Um, I'm going to pass to you. Mm, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I think it's, uh, yeah, Wales is very interesting, obviously, because uh, we are uh, uh, colonised, We are, you could say that. Um, and the Eisteddfod is, is also a very interesting context because it is a Welsh language context. So therefore, you could say that it's an exclusive uh, context. So of course, I'm a freelancer, so which is very fortunate. So therefore, when I apply for money from the Arts Council or from Visit Wales, you can, of course, collaborate with people. But, you know, you're totally aware situation because that's what Agora was for so it was you know right from the off we were going to discuss uh, independence because that was you know in the in the very title so we were going to talk about a relationship with England we were going to talk about a relationship with Europe and Brexit was going to be a part of that so it, again it depends and framing that to the funders okay was a little bit kind of fluid within that because if, if I was going to like say yes it's going to be political with a big P maybe they wouldn't have funded it. So again, there's a, there's a bit of flexibility within how you frame that. It doesn't really answer the question, does it? But I'm just sort of like... Um... No, but I think, I think it's interesting that we're coming to this, which is a crucial question, you know, the, the crucial question of how we create these spaces of openness. Because we're dealing with architecture, it's often dealing with resources. We're dealing with access to capital. You need capital. So the fact that the international school has capital means they can produce a space like this and a space that may be a space of further exclusion, but there is the possibility that it could open up something for artists who are desiring a space of refugia or refuge. I'm aware that we're coming. It's a horrible... Something. Three seconds, literally. We have one minute and 18 seconds left. Three seconds. The fact, uh, I took ownership of the project and I have submitted it to Andrew's open call at the PQ. So that's my um, taking a you know, a step further, I could have just, you know, taken my fee, um, mm. submitting my drawings, it's built, done. Um, that's not enough for me, so I advocate for it to become an open space to everybody in Kampala, rather than staying as an enclosed bubble of an international school that, thank God, found the money to build it, 
I'm advocating for it being an open space, publicly, openly, at the PQ. Thank you, Andreas. I'm aware there are more discussions to come and we'll have to take those to the bar outside because our, our technical team need a 15 minute break before the next session. And it would be terrible to sit here and talk more about um, spaces of exclusion while preventing them from having a break. <laughs> so thank you very much everyone and please thank the speakers.